Well, hey team, we are wrapping up our shepherding series here today. Um, what a journey this has been. So I wanted to walk back a little bit of what it is that we have talked through as we get ready for this last lesson, which I'm calling the new management of Jesus. And you probably are going to want your Bibles for this one. We are going to be spending most of our time in Ezekiel 34. And it's actually the chapter that made me realize that I really wanted to spend this time going through this study with you. As I was in my own personal study, I got to Ezekiel 34 and I just was like, wow, this is so for us, for the season that we're in. And so I am excited to be digging deep into it with you here today. And we started this whole study with just looking at the idea of shepherding throughout the Bible. So we looked from Genesis to Revelation. We looked at how many people, significant people in the Bible had um, a past in shepherding or had some kind of shepherding experience or just so many of them. And then we looked at how often just the analogy and the theme of shepherding comes up. We see it as God, as our shepherd, and that theme constantly throughout scripture. But we also see um, talking about us as sheep and so many references to just the tendencies of humanity and using the analogy of sheep to explain them. Um, we looked at, and, and we didn't dig deep into this, but this would be one of the themes of scripture, is that the spotless lamb is the sacrifice for sin. And I think that um, this could obviously be a lesson all in and of itself, but it just makes you think really differently about the fact that um, families who are from a shepherding community, they would offer the spotless lamb for the sacrifice of sins. Now, like if you've grown up in church, you would have known this is true. God in the Old Testament required um, there to be a sacrifice that would temporarily cover over um, the penalty for sin. And that temporary sacrifice provided this forgiveness, but they were, they were continually offering sacrifices for the sins of the family, for the sins of the community. And, and when you think about it through the shepherding lens, they were offering the very best of what they had. The pure spotless lamb was the only thing that God would accept. And, and for us, it kind of maybe just goes right over our head like, oh yeah, of course it would need to be perfect. But this was really their future. That would have been part of probably their breeding program. If they're going to continue building the quality of their flock, they would be looking for the very best lambs to build that flock. And so when God requires for the very best to be offered for the sacrifice of sins, it was this place of trust of having to say the financial future of our family and really what we know to do as shepherds and building the quality of the flock, we are going to take that, we're going to put that in the hands of God, and we are going to believe this physical sacrifice is going to provide this spiritual forgiveness. Now then we see that Jesus is the ultimate lamb of God. And he comes as the perfect sacrifice, physically offering his life. And in offering his life, we experience redemption, forgiveness of sins. He is the one sacrifice, not coming again and again and again to offer a sacrifice, but once and for all permanently, the Lamb of God is offered for the penalty of our sins and offers us this whole new place of being able to be in relationship with God. And then um, finally, we look at the fact that Jesus, in addition to God, is our good shepherd. John 10 goes deep into all of um, Jesus talking about his role as our shepherd, we as his sheep, and what that looks like. I think it would be a fun additional study to do um, alongside of this because we didn't really get the chance to dig as deep into that as we obviously could have. There's so many things we could have just like went off on in this study. Um, but last week we dove deep into this thought about ruling and shepherding. And we talked about the distinction of those two roles and yet how they intertwine. And we looked at how the role of the leader is to command and exercise authority. But then the role of the shepherd is really in serving the flock. And Jesus walks in both of these roles. In fact, the role of the shepherd is actually what paves the way for the role of the ruler and the authority and the kingship that he walks in and that he holds. Um, and so I want to build on that. We're going to go back to those some of those thoughts this last week. I know it was a deep dive last week, and I, I just want to put some more flesh on it this week. So we're going to be discussing some of those ideas as well. So if you would, 
get out your Bible, whatever it is that you are looking at here today. Let's look at Ezekiel 34, and we're going to be going through the whole chapter. So this is a lot of Bible um, here today, but I just want us to spend some time really examining these words because this whole chapter is really written to shepherds. So we're going to start in um, verse 1, and this is the English Standard Version that I'm reading, and I know sometimes I jump from translation to translation. That's what I'm reading out of here today. Starting in verse 1, and we're going to go through um, verse 10. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. And my sheep, they were scattered, they wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand and I will put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. So what we're, we're going to see inside of this chapter is a shift in management. In this passage, God is talking to the shepherds of Israel, the religious leaders of that day. And we would have seen similar things being spoken to the Pharisees and the Sadducees during Jesus' time on the earth is him looking at the role that they were supposed to be filling as religious leaders. And instead of serving the people, they were actually gaining from the people. So let's look at some of the things that um, he accuses them of in this passage. Uh, the first one, um, the shepherds, they gained at the expense of the sheep. And it really speaks to the priority of shepherds. Obviously, God wants um, all of his people to flourish. And those who serve him in the role of leaders, he wants their well-being. So it's not that God is wanting um, leaders to um, live in poverty and not have anything. But they're gaining at the expense of the flock. Instead of putting the needs of the flock first, they're feeding themselves and they're being able to sit back and relax while the flock suffers. So it speaks to the priority of heart. There's this selfishness that's taking place instead of this sacrificial leadership, this servanthood leadership that Jesus demonstrates. Next, we see that they refuse to be inconvenienced by the weak. The weak, they just um, were too difficult for them to handle or deal with. It was too much. And so we see a lack of sacrifice. They're not willing to go out of their way. They're not willing to put the time and the effort into the week. Next, um, they don't pave the way for healing. And and when I read this, this line in it, honestly, it struck me at such a deep level because it was um, hitting right in the midst of the COVID, the very first stages of it. And I had this wall of all the prayer requests that I was praying for, for our church and for people that I know. And, and so many of them were for healing. And I'm every day spending time praying over these individuals and over these families. And as I read this line, the shepherd stood in the way of the healing that God wanted to bring. Man, it just was like this, this resonating in my spirit is, wow, God, there is something you want to do in the people and the shepherds, the religious leaders, they have got to be in the place where they are actually the channels. They are the funnels through which that blessing and that healing, and that power of God is evidenced in the life of the people. Otherwise, um, we're in danger of stopping what it is that you want to see happen. And it also speaks to the authority that we talked a little bit about last week, because obviously none of us have the ability to heal anyone. And so it really speaks to, is there a place of spiritual authority that we're walking in? And we're going to dig deeper into that 
here in just a little bit. Um, and then they left the sheep to fend for themselves. So they weren't going and finding the sheep that were stray. They weren't gathering them. They weren't intentionally leading them. There was no um, strategy or intentionality that we talked about even in um, the first lesson that we went into about how shepherds, good shepherds, strategically lead the flock into health. So then at this point in the chapter, it turns. So he's talking to the religious leaders, and obviously these would have been the religious leaders of their day, um, and we're going to see a shift in management, but it also serves as a warning, these first 10 verses for all of us here today, because it's so easy for us to slip into those same kind of heart motivations. So even though we are talking about Israel, Old Testament, we're talking about the religious leaders before Jesus came on the scene and introduced all new management with his church and his disciples and his way of leading. And um, we still have got to take warning inside of this and make sure our heart is not in any of these places. So now though, the chapter switches inside of verse 11 and we begin to see this introduction of what is going to become the new management of Jesus. So starting in Ezekiel 34 verse 11, it says, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep and have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. So all the things that are a priority to the heart of God, they become a reality under his new management. That intentionality, that care, that protection of the flock that we've been talking about, they become a part of this new management that Jesus is introducing. And then at the end of that verse 16, it says, I will feed them in justice. And that is talking about divine law, not the laws of this world or any specific nation. It's speaking to both the roles of shepherding and rulership intertwined. And so then divine law is not just instituted, but then there's also this care and this shepherding that's taking place as well. And when Jesus came to reclaim rulership of the world, it was in the spiritual realm. And you would know this, the people were looking for him to come and establish rulership in the natural realm. They wanted him to come and take authority from the Romans, raise up an army and rule and declare natural justice. But Jesus came to do something at a much deeper level. He came to reclaim rulership from Satan and take back the authority of the earth in the spiritual realm, not the physical one. So the spiritual authority that we see Jesus walking in, even during his time here, um, is demonstrated through his forgiving of sins his healing of diseases, casting out demons, extending salvation. And any time that that would happen, you would see the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees around him who were so focused on natural authority. They wanted to rule on a very natural level. They wanted to have command of the people, tell them what to do and how to act and, and what was appropriate and what was not appropriate. But then they watched Jesus walking in this power and they would always ask, Whose authority are you doing this in? And we begin to see this, this understanding of power and authority that's all throughout the New Testament. We, In fact, a lot of times the, the words that are used there, even in the Greek, sometimes they'll interchange them. And you'll read the word power, and if you look back in the Greek, it's actually possibly the word for authority because they'll go hand in hand with each other because power is what is needed for authority to actually take place. You can think about it, power backs up authority. So it would be like the police officer who has the authority of the state to be able to enforce the law, but it's honestly his weapons and um, anything that he has with him in that moment that gives him the power to enforce that authority. 
It would be a dangerous situation for him to show up on the scene and try to exert authority without any power to enforce it. And in the same way, we begin to see the way that power and authority, they relate to each other inside of these passages. Colossians 2.15 talks about how Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. And this is talking about the spiritual rulers and authorities. There's now divine justice that's taking place inside of his kingdom. Now the laws of heaven, they are coming to earth and Jesus is walking in spiritual authority and we see spiritual power that's enforcing that spiritual authority. But then look at what happens inside of Luke 9. And this is so important for us to understand as we are understanding the new management of Jesus. Um, Luke 9, 1 through 2 says, he called the 12 together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So he calls all of his disciples together. And he says, um, I'm, I'm shepherding and you see Jesus so functioning as a shepherd, right? He's caring and he's protecting and he is intentionally leading his people. In fact, you just think about the way that he um, would be out in the middle of, of um, these these places, these open places where people would just gather to him. And, and it, you just see Jesus in this role as a shepherd leading the people. But then he's walking in this rulership role as well. He is walking in power. There are miracles taking place, demons being cast out. There is spiritual work that is happening that is establishing his authority. And now it's not just him, but he has called his disciples together. And he says, you have this power and authority because the great transfer is taking place where I have come to take the authority back from Satan and I'm investing it in the church, in my people, and they are going to be the ones that establish my authority through my power here on the earth. And instead of Acts 1-8, you see those disciples They've gone away. They have waited now for the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is going to do what? It's going to bring power in their life, which is going to evidence the fact that God has invested authority in them. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So authority in the spiritual realm, it's demonstrated through power. So when we, last week we were talking about those two different roles. We weren't really talking so much about natural authority, is that God's called you into this place of being able to command and rule. We are talking about God has called you into this place of spiritual authority, this place where you understand that you are pushing back the kingdom of darkness because Satan is like that squatter that even though he has been disarmed, he likes to proud around, act like he still has that same authority, which is not his any longer, but it belongs to the church. It belongs to you. It belongs to me. We're the ones who walk in that. Um, so you have the authority, you have the power in your own life over sin and darkness and the attacks of the enemy, but you also have this authority and power in the flock to the degree that you're submitted to the authority of God and his leaders. Because God, God's not creating something where there's just like rogue people out doing their own thing. God came and he invested authority into his kingdom. There's this united, um, they're governing authorities. He's given apostles and prophets and teachers. He has created this government. There is this authority that's invested in the whole, not just in individuals out kind of doing their own thing. And so there has to be this, this submission to God um, in order to walk in your power. I first have got to become this conduit. I've, I've got to be so submitted to you that it really is you because I have no power in and of myself. I can't heal anyone, but I'm so submitted to you that your power is, is evidenced through my life. And that comes through the unity of being in relationship with other believers, being under authority, spiritual authority inside of the church. Um, and, and really it's why then we are emphasizing, especially in this season, these prayer walks and just walking and praying over our city and our community because it's, it's not just about spending time with God individually, which is so important, but we're also calling up the leaders to exert spiritual authority inside of this moment because as the as the the kingdom of darkness tries to come in like a flood, God raises up a standard. 
He raises up people who say, whoa, 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 you do not have authority. That authority, it belongs to us as the church, but we've got to be the ones that walk in it. We can't just leave it on the table. What happens if we don't actually walk in the authority that God has given us? Then the enemy comes in and he just does whatever he wants to do. Even though he doesn't have the right to, if we're not going to pick up the authority, if we're not going to walk in the power, then he's going to do it. Um, it's why it's so important for us to be just taking the time to pray over the sick, the anxious, the overwhelmed, and just calling on the name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus to be demonstrated inside of these individuals, inside of these lives. It's why it's so important that you're hearing from God in this time. You're leaning in and you're, you're going, where is the enemy coming in? He's coming in on this side and this side. He's just coming in all, but I'm hearing by the Spirit of God, where we need to be paying attention. And even before I see the evidence of the enemy trying to attack in those places, I am walking in spiritual authority. Maybe you individually, maybe you guys as a couple, maybe as a small group, maybe as a team, you are just noticing some things and you're stepping in this place of praying and putting up that defense. We are protecting the flock all those who are being added to the church, they're coming under the protection and the covering of the kingdom of God. We're now under his authority. We, we're not out like those wandering sheep out in the middle of the nowhere that are just easy to get picked off. We are in the fold, part of the flock, part of the kingdom, and it's the authority of the name of Jesus that we rest in. So there's this new management that's coming, but then God also speaks to the flock as the management changes. So here he changes tones a little bit and he's not talking to the shepherds, either the shepherds of the old regime or prophetically speaking about the new management that's coming. He's actually talking to the flock themselves. Ezekiel 34 verse 17, it says, as for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water, that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet. And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you've muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you've scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord God, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So the spiritual leaders, they didn't fill their role. And the sheep, they just began to lead themselves as sheep will do, right? If no one's leading, if no one's saying, here's where we're going and here's what God is doing, then it's just the loudest voice wins. And so all of this rustling in between the sheep and, and it talks about in this passage then that the, the fatter sheep, the ones that are kind of rising up inside of this moment without really invested authority, they're just kind of taking charge inside of the moment. They're keeping the rest of the flock from being able to experience um, the good water that the shepherd would have for them. And anytime we see water, we know that that's talking about the presence of God. Um, Jesus was the one that says, I am living water. Come to me, all you who are thirsty. But not only are, are the flock not experiencing that water, but they're drinking the muddy, nasty water that they had, they had stepped in, that whatever horrible stuff was in that water. It's just nothing worth drinking. And yet that's what the flock is, is drinking from. And really he's calling out the selfishness. He's calling out um, muddying the path. There's no clarity to get to Jesus. We're making it about all these other things. And we're living in a day and an age where you're seeing this happen. You get on Facebook, you get on social media, and you're seeing people just talking about anything and everything. And I just think like, you know what, I don't even know what truth is anymore about vaccines and about this or that or whatever. I mean, conspiracy theories and politics and all the insanity going on. And, and it's hard to know who is even telling the truth. Whose side should I be on? And, and really, that, that can just muddy the water. And the Jesus has got to be what we are all about. Like it cannot be any other thing because nothing else saves. If somebody has the right thought about this pandemic and what we should do, honestly, it doesn't get them any closer to salvation at all. They have the right thought about vaccines and Bill Gates and whatever is happening out there, regardless of if they stumbled upon this is the exact right way to think about all of it. 
It's not going to get them any closer to salvation. And it's so easy for the flock to muddy the water. And, and people, they, they don't need our best ideas. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. And so when the shepherd comes, he just, he just puts a stop to it. We are not going to make this about anything else. This is not about um, whatever rules and regulations and whether constitutional rights are being violated. This is about Jesus. He has got to be what we're all about. We are leading people to the clean, clear, living water so that they can experience him. I think about the Calvary Chapel movement um, that happened um, years ago. And if, if you don't know very much about church history, there was this great movement that took place of people just starting to come to Jesus. And I honestly believe we're on the brink of it. I believe that we are about to see people coming to Jesus in droves. But what set the Calvary Chapel movement apart from so many other churches during that time is that they just held on with all all that they had, white knuckled it, this is going to be about Jesus. So they would see people come in and they would come in without shoes. They would come in dirty. They would come in still a little bit high on whatever it is that they had um, just previously. They, they were in like crazy relationships. That they, they were a mess. And instead of turning them away at the door and going like, um, you know, we have this really beautiful building and we have these really pretty programs and we're afraid to have you around our children. And I just don't think that we're the kind of community for you. The Calvary Chapel movement and the leaders, they just set this precedent. We are going to be about Jesus. So you are welcome here. If we have to get rid of the carpet, if we have to get rid of all of the pews, if we got to sell the building, if we got to do whatever we got to do, we are going to lead people to Jesus. And honestly, I just feel that so deep in my heart right now as we're getting ready even for church at home gatherings um, in our community. I, I was just talking to some of our leaders. I just want us to be all about Jesus. I don't want the issue to be about face masks or social distancing, or whatever else it is, whatever we got to do, honestly, like there's some, I have my own personal convictions about um, some of these things. I'm not necessarily afraid of a virus or anything else, but whatever I have to do to lead people to Jesus, that's where I want to be. I want to be mudding the water and making it about something that it's really not about. I just want to be leading people to Jesus. And that's why I saw the Calvary Chapel movement doing so well in their time. And because of that, God was able to entrust them with so many individuals. So many people experienced Jesus because they just, they just refused to make it about anything else but him during that time. I want to wrap this up really quick. In Ezekiel 35, going on to verse 25, I just want to look at this prophetic picture. And, and as, as we read this, this is going to be the last kind of piece. And then you can discuss this with your team. I just want you to maybe just take a moment. And I just want you to let God wake up your imagination at a new level. Because really what he is doing is he's casting vision for something so beautiful under the management of Jesus. Something that is so far beyond our ability to produce on our own. It really comes from us learning at the feet of Jesus how to be shepherds, how to be rulers, how to walk in spiritual authority, how to have his power moving through our lives so that we are seeing the flourishing of his people even in the most difficult of times. It's like the oasis in the desert, the people flourish even when there's difficulty all around. So let me read it to you. And I just want you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Um, verse 25 starts, I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season and they shall be showers of blessing. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield its increase and they shall be secure in the land. And they shall know that I am the Lord. When I break the bars of their yoke and I deliver them from the hand of those who enslaved them, they shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. You know, I just this last week, 
as we we're getting ready to wrap this whole thing up, I've just been praying about it, praying for you specifically all throughout the week and praying that God would do something more than just help us understand shepherding, but that he would just awake something inside of our spirits. And I actually, in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., woke up with just this burning thought on my heart is that healing is going to come to the land and it's going to come through the shepherds. It's going to come through the people. It's going to come um, not through like when we're able to just like reopen, gather everybody in a big building and they all get to experience God together, even though that that is such an important thing that we are looking forward to expectantly. We're looking forward to being all together again. But really when every single one of us take ownership of what God's called us into and we walk in that place of authority, when we walk in that place of shepherding, then we can be at the grocery store and we can just notice that, hey, there's, there's that lost stray sheep and there's, there's a conversation that needs to be had and maybe all of a sudden that, that person starts to come back in the flock. Hey, I'm talking to someone and they're just experiencing the agitation, frustration, difficulty of this season. They, they are just being weighed down by all that the enemy is trying to do in their life. But we can just stop right here, right now, and we can pray together because there is a spiritual authority that's been invested in us. And when two or three of us gather together and we pray, there he is in the midst of us. There's just this place that as we ourselves begin to carry the presence of God with us and we extend the kingdom of God, I just see it moving throughout our city, reaching people in places that we weren't reaching before. So even though COVID has brought all this difficulty into our lives, I believe God is setting up something so incredible, something so beautiful that we would begin to see whole pockets of people just being ministered deeply to by the presence of Jesus, by understanding from the scripture, being led into these pastures, experiencing the care of him as their shepherd, and flourishing in this season. So let me pray for you and we'll wrap up. It's been such an honor to be on this journey with you. I would love to hear your thoughts from this. We're actually going to probably be going back, working through this series and just preparing it for future small group leaders and team leaders that would be raised up in Sun City Church. So if you have thoughts about what should be added or included or, or just different um, feedback from this, I'd love to hear it. You can email me at jamie, J-A-M-I-E, at suncitychurch.com. So let me pray for you and then you can talk with your team leaders um, and wrap up this series all together. Father, I thank you for each of these individuals. God, it's it's just been, um, it's been such a rich experience feeding from you. God, in so many ways, I feel like I have been just sitting at your feet, just like the disciples did physically inside of your time when you were walking the earth and just listening and receiving. And it has fed my soul at such a deep level. It has awakened something inside of me. And, and God, I believe for your, your whole church, God, there's a new place of walking in authority, a new place of shepherding, a new place of ruling. There's new management that has, has come. And God, we don't want to be those who just um, abandon that role and that call of God. We just leave that, that place of authority for the enemy to just wreak havoc. But God, we want to take up that role of learning how to sacrificially lead people, walking in the power of God in our lives and seeing your authority extended, that divine justice demonstrated in the world around us. So God, we're praying for it in our individual hearts and lives. God, we're praying for it in our families. God, we're praying for it in our small groups and in our teams. And God, we're praying for it for all those that you would see fit to add to our church. It is an honor, God, to serve you. It's just mind-blowing to think that you chose us and that you continue to invest in us, that the work that you started in us, God, you're going to see it through to completion. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining me for this series, and I cannot wait till the day we are all together in the same room again. All right, see you guys later.